Hey, welcome to Trucks. You are going to love today's show because today's the day that we take Crazy Horse out and put it through the paces. Now, you may not recognize it yet, but <laughs> this is Crazy Horse covered with a beautiful coat of mud. But before we show you how it got into this condition, here's a reminder of what we showed you last week with the buildup of the grinding and the welding and all the work that went into this rig and what it looked like before we got it muddy. What a piece of junk! <laughs> Check this out. All right, now that the reminder is done and everything's bolted down for the last time, it's time to see what this thing's really made of in every kind of driving situation imaginable. The first thing we needed to look at was the drivability and the road manners. Buzzing along here at about 65 miles an hour. RPMs are about 2,500. That is right where we want it. This thing's tooling right down the road. Notice that there is no shimmy in the steering wheel. Take the hands off, drives right down the road. This is what we want. Not only did the rig track down the road well at freeway speeds, but the dirt grip tires didn't make near the noise I thought they would. Pretty amazing considering the aggressive tread. Now you may notice that my steering wheel is not exactly trued up, and you know that that is a pet peeve of mine, but with this Bronco, you've got one gauge off to the side, and the type of steering wheel I've got here, that puts the spokes right out over my gauges. So I've purposely cocked it just a little bit so I can see my gauge as well when I'm going down the road. Now that may drive me crazy after a while, but right now I'm gonna leave it like that. Okay, with our steering and our suspension all checked out and our gauges reading where they were supposed to, it was time to uncork this thing and see what kind of power and performance we had on tap. This is great. Not only does the truck have an awesome sound, but also the power to throw you back in the seat whenever you stomp on it. Now add to that the joy of shifting your own gears, and you've got the ingredients for one incredible driving experience. For you guys that have ever wanted a muscle car that was four wheel drive, you need to look into an early Bronco. They are sweet. Of course, all this ripping and hot rodding revealed two things. First, our power steering belt took a holiday due to a slight pulley misalignment. The heck was that? Which, of course, was easily corrected. The second, well, the second's not quite so easy to fix. It's a thirsty little sucker. Now to make sure Crazy Horse isn't just some sissy, fair weather rig, we also ventured out on some cold, rainy, snowy days just to see how it handled it. This is actually a really good test because we're out here on a bad weather day doing a payoff on this rig to see if it's really roadworthy. It looks pretty roadworthy to me, except for those wipers. Somebody needs to develop a kit to synchronize the windshield wipers on a Bronco. <laughs> and one thing's for sure, if you ever want to live to father children, make sure that you install your heater before you do a test drive in the middle of the winter. Son, it's freezing. And other than being a little drafty, yeah, it's up to par with anything running down the road. However, high horsepower, a five-speed, and a locker in the rear can make this thing a little squirrely when things get wet and slick. One thing that a lot of people don't know is if you're running a locker or any kind of limited slip in bad weather, you need to be careful because that rear end will come right up from underneath you quicker than you can imagine. Okay, okay, enough of that. How about handling? Now, even though it's pretty obvious that Crazy Horse will never be mistaken for a sports car, 
We wanted to see how it did in everything from some twisty turns to freeway off ramps. Now while it does have some body lean, it never felt excessive or tippy. However, if you push it a little bit, like we did around the cones, the hardcore off-road suspension becomes evident pretty quick. But what the heck, it's a Bronco! So after subjecting it to the embarrassment of the slalom course, we decided to run a different kind of slalom course, one specifically for four-wheel drive rigs. Bonsai. Of course, that's just a hint of what's to come because now it's time to get off the pavement and let this horse run. So hold on, we go off-road after the break. Welcome back to Trucks and the long-awaited payoff of Project Crazy Horse. Now, so far, we've looked at the on-road capabilities of this little 66 half-cab Bronco, and it's been great, but that's only part of what it is. The other part begins when you get off the pavement. Now, there are a lot of different aspects of off-road driving. We're going to look at all of them just to see how well-rounded this rig is. And since it's paying tribute to Parnelli's legendary Baja racer, Big Ole, stability at speed is a must. Now, running this rig down a dirt road or across the field with a pedal down is a major rush. as the suspension absorbs the rough terrain like it's not even there. And if the bumps are too big, well, we'll just fly right over them. Now you've seen what it'll do in two-wheel drive. Now let's see what it'll do in four-wheel drive. With the rig locked into four-wheel drive, it was time to start wheeling. And the first thing I wanted to look at was the approach and departure angles of the vehicle, as well as the overall flex and movement of the suspension. Man, so far this old Bronco has pretty much made a joke of everything I've done. Making it real easy. This is a quite the rig. With that done and everything checked out, we moved on to the rocks where we could really flex this thing and see what it was capable of. The big fender cutouts and high ground clearance kept the tires and rocks from ever hitting the body, and we flexed and walked our way through the rocks without any problems. The low range crawl ratio was good, but there were a few times I wished I had a little lower first gear. Now as far as traction goes, if I was going to use this rig as primarily a rock crawler, I'd put a locker in the front instead of the limited slip. That would solve this problem, and we would go over the rock instead of pushing it. Another obstacle that's pretty common when you go off-roading is the steep hill climb. Not just the short little quick ones, but also the long steep ones that require a rig that's not going to puke out and die on you halfway up the hill. This kind of hill is what makes the guys running carburetors cringe and use the bypass trail. She's making it look easy. However, Crazy Horse went up it like it was out for a Sunday drive. Coming back down was another story, as it revealed one weakness that will have to be fixed. 
Now due to the type of oil pan I'm running and the steepness of the grade, all the oil ran to the front and uncovered the sump, which starved the engine of oil. Chris, I shut it off because I was, uh, I had no oil pressure. My, oil, my sump got empty. Copy. No oil meant I had to shut it down to prevent damage and freewheel the rig down the mountain, which is never a good thing. A different oil pan or an oil accumulator will solve this problem. We'll be back with more Crazy Horse after this. Hey, welcome back to Trucks and the Crazy Horse Payoff. Now you've seen it on the road, in the rocks, on the hills. We still got a lot more to do, so strap in, cause here we go. At this point, it was time to get this truck a little wet. So into the river we went to play on some wet rocks. And of course, the crew always comes prepared and Chris thought that those waders would be enough to keep him dry, but I just couldn't resist. We've all been here. Anybody who's worked with Stacy for any period of time has been where I am right now. <laughs> While Chris was drying out, we decided to test the suspension yet another way. And even with a heavy winch on the front, nothing flies like a Bronco. Of course, the final muddy obstacles for this truck are the toughest because they involve a little bit of everything we've seen so far and they will do some damage if your rig's not up to it. And the only way to drive them is to attack them. <laughs> and the only real casualty of the day was the poor spare tire mount whose mounting brackets just worn up to the abuse and finally decided it had had enough and exited the rig in a big mud hole. I guess we need a new one of those. <laughs> and well, you know, there was that thing with Moe's camera. <laughs> Everybody good? <laughs> yeah, Moe's great. <laughs> But no matter what we threw at it, Crazy Horse took it and just begged for more. What an awesome rig. Now, some of you may be thinking, oh man, I can't believe you just went out and thrashed this truck. Well, believe it, because you deserve to see what it's capable of. But I didn't thrash it. No, man. I built this thing to be able to do exactly what I just did to it and more. Trust me, this thing wasn't even breathing hard. And as far as the way it looks, well, we'll just roll it in and clean it up. It will look just as good as when we started. And that is a well-rounded vehicle. But the best part about this buildup is hopefully now you can see that it's possible to take something that is a total piece of junk and turn it into something really special. If you add your time, your skill, your money, and some aftermarket parts. So the ball is in your court. Get out there and build something. We expect to see you on the trail. When you're talking big diesel engines, you're talking big power. Now to help build that big power, you need a big turbo. Of course, using a big turbo can build some big heat. And we know that heat does not make power. So what's the solution to this problem? Well, it's very simple if you know how it works. How it works is brought to you by WyoTech. All right, Dan, that's the problem. How do we get the temperature out of the air coming out of the turbo to get the power we need? Stacy, it's just like you said before, these turbos put out a lot of heat. And a good example of that is just like a piston. When it draws that intake air in and then compresses it, we're producing a lot of heat in there. Mm -hmm. Same thing with our turbos. The intake air in, we compress it, then what do we have? Boost. 
and heat. Boost and heat. <laughs> okay. exactly. And what kind of heat do you have coming through this? We're probably talking between 300 and 350 degrees at maybe 32 to 38 pounds of boost. Okay, now you can't build any power with that kind of temperature, right? We want to try to knock that down, no doubt, to keep the temperature out of the engine. Okay. Tell us about the aftercooler here. What happens is we have 300 degrees or 350 coming across the front of our aftercooler. Now we have the outside temperature coming through it, cooling it. All right, so depending upon the temperature of the outside air, will determine about how much cooling that we're going to have as we come across the front of the aftercooler. Now, what kind of a temperature drop do you have from this side to that blue side? I would say at least a minimum of 100 degrees, and it can be more than that depending upon the temperature, again, of the outside air as okay. it goes through our aftercooler. Okay, so then that cool air, boom, into the intake, power, strength, everything we're after, right? Exactly. Okay, now, normal cooling system, we use water to cool. This uses air. Why and is that better or not? It's, this is much better because we're getting a lot more cooling out of it. In the old days we used to use water after cooling mm -hmm. and we could only get it down to the temperature of the water which might be 180 or 190 degrees. Now with the outside temperature being much less than that we got a lot more cooling. Okay. Now after coolers hanging in front we got the cooling system going here. The guy's running down the road not paying attention to his gauges. Got his foot buried in it. What happens if he overheats it? Does it just melt the engine down or what, what happens? On this particular one, it's an electronically controlled engine. And what happens if this air happens to get all the way over there at too hot of a degree, then that ECM is going to say, uh-uh, you're not going to do that. We're going to shut you down and it derates the engine and cuts your horsepower back. So you're not going to hurt that engine. And, and then it cools it down. And then once it's cooled down, you get the power back. It'll come right back to so you. The engine's smarter than the driver. Sure is. <laughs> okay. Well, that gives you an idea how heat is pulled out of the intake char so you get a nice, dense blast of air into your engine. That is how it works. You know, people are always saying that life is full of choices, and that obviously is true, especially when you're talking about motor oil. You have conventionals, you have synthetics, you have synthetic blends, and what does all that mean, and what do they do? Very good questions. We're going to lay it out for you. First, you have a conventional oil. Now this is basically refined from crude oil, been around forever, gives you great protection, and this is the most affordable. The next step up is a synthetic blend. Now this is a conventional oil mixed with synthetic components. This gives you better protection, better stability. Then the next step up is a full synthetic. Now this doesn't have a lot in common with a conventional because it's pretty much created in a laboratory, not at the refinery, but it gives you the best protection, best stability of any oil out there. Unfortunately, it comes at the highest price. However, you don't have to change it as much because it is so good. This stuff just won't hardly break down. So as you can see, you've got some choices here. Castrol's got your oils. Which one you decide to use is up to you.